Most people who are overweight tell me that they'd prefer not to be. And if dieting was easy, frankly, most people would do it because that would be a good solution. But the trouble is that dieting is really quite hard. It takes a lot of effort. You have to eat less of the things you'd quite like to eat a bit more of, or you have to eat them less often. What well, one way and another, it takes real effort to lose weight. And so if you're contemplating whether or not you should really spend the time and effort in dieting, I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask, is dieting really worth it? And if you stop to think for a moment that maybe you would, you might then open your newspaper or magazine and you would be so bamboozled by all of the headlines about what kind of diet you should or shouldn't follow, it's not at all surprising that some people pull the duvet over their head and think, when the experts agree, then I'll do something about it. But until then, maybe I'm fine just as I am. And it's perhaps no great uh, surprise that although losing weight is generally in the top two or three of New Year's resolutions, I think it's quite interesting that this year, 2018, actually it isn't. Yes, people are talking about eating better and exercising more, but actually dieting didn't make it into the top few New Year resolutions. And that very reputable and important journal that, of course, I read uh, all the time, the Waitrose Weekend magazine, told me very confidently, or had a headline, Oh, weight loss diets a thing of the past. Well, uh, some of you might have a, a moment or two of amusement as you remember some of those diets that have been, uh, and many of them have gone. Although, as you'll hear as I go through the talk, some of them are still with us. And one might even say that some of the old ones may perhaps be some of the best. Now, it's not just part of the public conversation about whether dieting is really worthwhile, but a very esteemed professor, Mickey Stunkart, who was in fact called the Dean of Obesity Research because he was the guy who was doing obesity research long before most people were. He was interested in the genetics of obesity. He did lots of work on twins and how, and how their body weight um, evolved over time. He did work on eating behaviours, on night eating syndrome, a whole raft of interesting research. But one of the things for which he is uh, most quoted is this remark. Most, person, most obese persons will not stay in treatment. Most will not lose weight. And of those who do lose weight, most will regain it. And this has become one of the most highly cited sentences in the whole of obesity research. So, if he was questioning if diet's worth it, uh, maybe we should too. But the fact is that lots of people are still doing it. So this is data from something called the Health Survey for England, which asks about 15,000 people a whole series of questions, makes some measurements of their weight and their health. And in 2013, this data happens to come from, um, the question of how we uh, ask people if they were currently dieting. What you see is about a half of adults say they're on a diet. It's not entirely clear what they mean by that, but nonetheless, they answer yes to the question, are you currently on a diet? Slightly worryingly, 30% of women who aren't even overweight say that they're on a diet. But it does increase as people uh, become heavier. So if we look amongst people who we would classify in sort of medical terms as being uh, obese, then uh, actually you see that something like 70% of men and 80% of women are dieting. So people are conscious that they need to do something um, about their weight. The sad fact, though, is that in this country we're still seeing the prevalence, the number of people who are obese, going up year on year. So the latest figures tell us that 26% of men, 27% of women, so about a quarter of adults, are clinically obese. They're in this category um, up here. So despite lots of people reporting that they're trying to diet, there's not a whole lot of evidence from simple survey data that people are being particularly successful. 
Now, it's against that backdrop that in my research team in the, in the Biomedical Research Centre, we've been really trying to understand a little bit more about uh, how successful people are when they diet and what are some of the most effective ways to lose weight. And so the first question we have to ask is, well, what is success? What counts as successful treatment for obesity? Is it about achieving a healthy body weight, having a BMI less than 25? Is that what it's about? That's pretty ambitious if you're starting off with a BMI of 30, 40, or even higher. Or on the other hand, is success simply weighing less than you did at the start? That you've lost some weight, any weight, and that's success. Do we want to set a threshold where we say, OK, you have to have lost 5%, or is it 10% of your initial weight? And doctors will often say that 5% is a clinically significant target. Not quite sure where the evidence for that comes from, but it's often said. And then we have to say, well, OK, is it just about the weight you lose right now, or do you have to keep the weight off? Does it count as success if you put the weight back on? So do you have to keep it off for a year, or five years, or forever? Is it about being lighter than you would have been without dieting? There's a whole raft of ways that we as scientists try to quantify success. But in fact, when I talk to people about their dieting experience, they often count it in very, very different ways. Um, and I thought you might be um, interested in uh, a patient's perspective on what is success. So this is a gentleman we've been uh, doing some work with recently who's actually been very successful. He's lost five stone. <coughs> And when I asked him, what did he think of as success? These were the, the reasons, he, these were the things he defined as success in the order in which he gave them to me. And the first one was just to sit cross-legged in a chair is wonderful. I can't remember when I could do that before. And so often it's these small things which give people the positive feedback to continue and to want to maintain their early success. Of course, another thing that was very important for him was about improving his health. And he was one of the people who started off with type 2 diabetes. And after nine weeks of his diet, he was in remission from his diabetes and able to stop all of his diabetes medication. That is pretty life-changing for people. More of that later. So, Let's turn now to some evidence. What is it that clinical trials tell us about dieting success? So this is where we do a planned research study. We put people into a trial and we can follow them up over time. Now, unfortunately, not that many studies follow people for many years after. But some have done. And I've just put some examples of that here. And they're in sort of chronological order. Um, apart from this little group of men here who were remarkably unsuccessful, and I don't quite know what they were doing or not doing, um, apart from that, most of these trials, which have followed people up over four or five years, generally find that somewhere between 20% up to perhaps 35% are, are able to maintain a substantial weight loss at least four or five years down the line. And in fact, it looks as though some of the more recent trials are rather more successful than we've seen in the past, which is encouraging. So in two of the biggest studies that have been done recently, we can say that about a third of people have remained more than 7% below their baseline weight four or five years later. And that's generally about a stone lighter than they started. And I think that is a pretty reasonable um, claim to success. So the question really is, if you're thinking about dieting, how can you maximise your chance that you'll be one of those successful dieters? Because clearly dieting is more worthwhile if you're successful. Now, if you go out on the street and ask people about the most successful diet, I can assure you there is a huge amount of opinion. And if you open the newspapers, there's even more opinion, and they'll give you all sorts of ideas of what you might do and what's going to be successful. I have to say, this is firmly in the category of opinion rather than evidence. And in fact, it appears to be opinion which is mostly given by people who probably don't actually need to lose weight in the first place. 
So what we're much more interested in is studies which uh, provide absolute empirical evidence of what works and which importantly are studies which are done in the people who we want to help and support to lose weight. So all of the work that I'm going to show you from here on in relates to empirical evidence and it's also done in people who are overweight. So just a little bit of background, and please excuse me if this feels like a, it's a tutorial. Maybe that's appropriate here in the academic lecture theatre. But I'm going to tell you about two different kinds of research. Some of the studies I'll show you are what we call randomised control trials. So what we mean by that is you take a group of people and you randomly allocate them to two or more groups. So you have an equal chance of being in either group. Typically, one group gets the intervention, gets the treatment, and the other one doesn't, or they get a different intervention. Then we measure the outcome at some specified time point, usually their weight, and we do some statistical tests to say, is the difference between these two groups a real difference, or might it just be chance? What we can then say is if we find a difference, we can attribute that directly to the intervention being tested because we assume that all other things were equal. So that's a randomised control trial, and I'll show you some examples of that. The other kind of research I'm going to show you is something called a systematic review. Now, what systematic reviews try to do is to say, let's look at the totality of evidence. Because, you know, the reality is one trial might show one thing and another might show another, how do you bring them together and understand what overall is the answer? And the thing about systematic reviews is they, um, they address a specific research question which we've decided in advance. And then, crucially, they use standardised methods which are aimed to minimise the amount of bias. Because if you want to look at all the evidence, you have to look at all the evidence. You can't go cherry picking, oh well, I quite like the look of that study and I like that one. You have to say in advance what your search terms are, which studies you're going to look at, and then you have a very standard method for pulling them all together and looking at what the overall answer to the question is. And so the aim of these systematic reviews is to produce more reliable findings than any one individual study can possibly hope to do. So we'll see examples as we go through of those two uh, uh, approaches to research. So the first one I'm going to start with is a systematic review. Now this looks really, really daunting, but don't fear too much. Let me just explain, because once you've got your head around this, you'll be able to follow the, the ones that come. So there's a whole series of studies. These are the different studies. And what we've simply done is put the results all on the same scale. And essentially, if it lies to the left of the, this centre line, it favours the intervention. That means the intervention group did better. If it's on the other side, it means the control group did better. So what we're hoping to see is that the intervention works, it's on the left-hand side, and the lines around the dots give you the uncertainty, the sort of confidence interval. And then at the very bottom, what we do is to bring them all together. And so the diamond you see at the bottom is the integrated analysis. And so the crux of it is, is this diamond to the left or to the right of the line? What you see here is it's firmly to the left. And this, I should have told you what this was, shouldn't I? Sorry. So this analysis is looking at self-help. This is looking at what most people who decide they're going to diet do. It's the kind of DIY dieting. So they might buy a book, they might look on a website, they get some information for themselves and they try to follow that plan. And what these studies have done is to look at people who've tried to do that um, versus people who, who haven't really. What you see is after six months, typically people have lost almost two kilos. So people in the intervention group who've followed some sort of diet plan are almost two kilos lighter than people who haven't done that. So trying to lose weight does definitely work. You get some benefit, but it's relatively modest. Now the question that I'm asked probably more than any other about dieting is, OK, well, if I'm going to go get a book, which one should I buy? Which is the diet that works best? 
And of course, there's a plethora of choice. Do you want low fat? Do you want low carb? Do you want high protein? Do you want food combining? Which one should you pick? And so the very simple answer is, you know, probably doesn't really matter that much. There is really no good evidence that one type of diet in terms of low fat or low carb or high protein, if you like, the nutrient composition makes very much difference. So this is just one study which shows that very nicely. So this is a randomized trial, four arms here, um, four different diets. So one of them was high protein, this one was low carb, this one's basically, Weight Watch is basically a standard health eating calorie counting. And then you've got the Ornish diet, this is popular in the States. It's an extremely low fat diet. These blobs show the weight change in the individual people in each of those groups. And what you see in the line is the average weight loss. The fact is, the average weight loss in all four diets was pretty well exactly the same. What you also see is that on every single diet, some people did brilliantly, they were losing 20 kilos. Other people didn't lose any weight at all. In fact, in every diet, some people put weight on. And I have to say, we do see that in our trials too. Astonishingly, people come into a weight loss study and manage a year later to have put weight on. So what we don't know from this is whether the people who were really successful on this particular diet, would they have been successful on a different diet? Is it something about the person? Or were we just very lucky that they got the right diet for them? And we don't know the answer to that. But the take-home message is that on average, there's no difference between low-fat, low-carb, high-protein. Um, and some people do very, very well on every one of them, and some people don't. What matters more is whether you stick to it. So at the end of this study, they simply asked people, how well did you stick to your diet? And they scored themselves 0 to 10. And what you see is whichever diet you were on, the more you stuck to it, ha-ha, funnily enough, the more weight you lost. So what matters is sticking to it. And therefore, the right diet for you, the best diet for you, is the one that gives you the greatest chance you're going to be able to stick to it. If you cannot imagine life without pasta, a low-carb diet is not for you. Um, not always that easy to decide, but that's one top tip. So that's self-help. Now, self-help works, but um, what we're interested in, because I'm in the Department of, of Primary Care, is whether, in fact, if people had some help and support from their healthcare team, whether perhaps they might be more successful. And because we know being overweight is associated with significant ill health, it's a really important question to say, well, could we actually do something which would help people to manage their weight and therefore improve their long-term health? The thing is, as we all very, very well know, our healthcare systems are under real pressure at the moment. There isn't a whole load of time and capacity for us to pull in a sports scientist and a psychologist and a dietitian to help people lose weight. So what we've been trying to understand is whether there are interventions which we could use in routine healthcare, which a generalist practitioner could offer, um, perhaps your practice nurse. And we did a review, another of these systematic reviews, which looked at all the studies in the literature which um, could, could be used in routine care. Not necessarily that they are being done, but they could be done without a huge scaling up of resources or massive training. What you see here is that when we compare the intervention group, you can see again this diamond at the bottom is firmly on the left-hand side. So people who are in the intervention group definitely do better than people in the control. And this time, what we see is that the average weight loss after one year now was almost three kilos. At least that's the difference between the two groups, was almost three kilos. In fact, the control group lose about one kilogram, so the absolute weight loss is about four kilos in the treatment group. So that's, um, yeah, about nine or ten pounds. So, into Getting support from a health professional gives you greater weight loss than trying to do it yourself. But those of you who are BDI'd will see that all of these different trials actually are quite different. Some of them were really effective. The line is well to the left. Um, others were not so effective. 
So what is it which creates those differences? I'm not going to go into it in huge detail, but what we were interested in was two particular types of programmes. One is interventions which are delivered by the primary care staff. They do it themselves. The practice nurse generally, not always, offers an intervention. And as somebody who is a huge supporter of the NHS, somebody who trained as, as a dietitian, I was actually very sad to see that if we look at these randomised control trials, unfortunately there is no evidence that people are any lighter at the end of a year than they were if they were in the control arm. You can see this diamond at the bottom is bang on that middle line, and the average weight loss was only 0.2 kilos greater. That doesn't mean that some individual practitioners aren't doing a fantastic job. That's perfectly possible. But the evidence we have from trials is that these are no more effective than the control treatment. In contrast, if we take the subgroup of studies which involved referring people to one of the community weight loss groups, things like Weight Watchers, Slimming World, Rosemary Connolly, that type of thing, what you can see is that again there are a few studies and now this diamond lies firmly to the left hand side. There is clear evidence that people who are referred to one of these uh, community weight loss groups are lighter on average at the end of one year. Typically, um, the difference is about two kilos, since the control group lost about a kilo. If you look at the actual weight losses here, you can see that people were typically losing um, about three kilograms. This doesn't mean that people went to these groups for a whole year. They probably only went to them for a few weeks or a few months. But what we're doing is looking at them a year later because we thought that was a reasonable time to say, look, has this had some lasting effect on people's weight? Now, these are all different studies, the two slides I've shown you, but here we did a trial which compared them head to head. So this is one of our trials, and it's the biggest one that's been done, directly comparing referring people to Weight Watchers or to what we call standard care. And that was treatment, a uh, weight management programme delivered by the practice nurse. And what you can see is over the course of the year, at every time point, people who were referred to Weight Watchers lost more weight. So at the end of the year, they lost about twice as much weight as the people who saw the practice nurse. Now that was only over one year, and, but the good thing was that as a result of publishing that trial, there was a really significantly more interest from the commissioners of healthcare services to start commissioning these kinds of programmes. And so for some while, we saw year on year that more and more people were getting access to things like these, these weight loss groups through the NHS. If you like, it was a sort of, you know, a weight loss on prescription type services. Um, typically, though, they only gave people access to the service for 12 weeks. And one of our concerns was that that just might be a bit too short. You know, is 12 weeks enough to change what might well be the habits of a lifetime? And so we did an, another study which explored the difference between going to uh, Weight Watchers in this case for 12 weeks or having access for a whole year. What if you were able to have vouchers which allowed you attend, to attend the groups for much longer? So this is another randomised control trial and now we've got three groups of people. We've got our control group who got basically a weight loss booklet. So they were just given a, a, it was the BHF booklet, so you want to lose weight. And then we had two groups, one who were given uh, vouchers to attend Weight Watchers for free for 12 weeks, and one group who had vouchers to attend for a whole year, if they wanted to. We don't frog march them to the classes, we just give people the opportunity to go for 12 weeks or for a whole year. And we followed them up this time for two years, and this is what we saw. First really important thing is that all three groups did quite well, all three groups lost weight. So simply having your doctor encourage you to lose weight and offer to see you again at 3, 12 and 24 months to see how you're getting on, actually those people were still were two kilos lighter at the end of two years. But the groups who had access to Weight Watchers did better and perhaps as you might imagine those who could go for 12 months actually did best of all. So extending the period of access to these programs increases weight loss. 
So they lost about seven kilos in the first 12 months and they were still five kilos lighter at the end of two years, on average. Some people have done much better than that. Some people haven't lost any weight at all. And averages can be a little bit misleading. So let's look who was what we might call successful. So this is this five or 10% weight loss. What we see is that one in four people who were offered the 12 week referral lost 5% and one in eight of them actually lost 10% of their weight at 12 months. So one in eight people were 10% lighter. If we give people a longer program, they lose more weight. So if you had access to the longer program, about a quarter of people were 10% lighter a year later. And that, I think, is a really fantastic result for people in routine primary care. And you won't be surprised that actually attending the program uh, makes a difference. So the, the, the data I've shown you previously is people who were offered the opportunity to do it, this is actually looking at what they did. Did they hand the voucher in? And what you see, interestingly, is that people who didn't go at all actually lost some weight. Not really surprising. They wanted to lose some weight. They just got on and did a bit of it themselves. That's the sort of DIY approach. But people who attended not that many sessions, one to nine sessions over 12 weeks, frankly, didn't do much better. But the people who really stuck with the programme, really engaged with it, actually lost the most weight of all. So once again, it's sticking with the programme that really makes the difference. And the good thing was, is people actually perceived these programmes to be quite helpful. Um, it, you know, one of the huge advantages of these community groups is that you can see somebody regularly. You know, every Wednesday at 6.30 in the village hall. That, frankly, is a great deal easier than trying to go to see your practice nurse. Um, and we can't, with the best will in the world, imagine that we'll be able to see people with that kind of regularity. People also said that they liked the very structured plan that the programme offered, whereas um, health professionals tend to try to be a little bit more flexible and to match it into your lifestyle, which sounds good in theory, but in practice, people really liked the very rigid structure to just get them going on a diet. But so far, I've been talking really just about weight loss. And weight loss is important, and I focused on that because we know from a whole raft of other work that if people lose weight, their health improves. But actually, how much does health improve if you lose this sort of amount of weight? And so this is some analysis by one of my colleagues, Liz Morris, who's, who's here this evening. And what Liz has done is to take the data from the two trials that I've just shown you and looked at what's the relationship between the amount of weight people lose and the improvements in some of their risk factors for heart disease. So typically, in those two trials, people have lost 5% of their weight on average. And what we see is that that leads to a reduction in blood pressure, about four millimetres of mercury. Um, but if you've got high blood pressure to start with, you get a bit more benefit than that, about five millimetres of mercury. And at the bottom, we've got the reduction in HbA1c. This is a measure of your risk of developing diabetes. What we see is that people who lose 5% get this reduction of 0.2 millimoles per litre. But actually, those who have diabetes at baseline get three times more benefit. And that really is a clinically significant and useful, important um, outcome measure. In fact, one way of thinking about it is that these reductions are about, uh, of, which are associated with losing an average 5%, are about equivalent to half a tablet that you might use to treat that condition. So some people who've been more successful than average, who've lost 10% of their body weight, remember that's one in four people, will be able to take out one blood pressure tablet, one diabetes tablet, as a consequence of their weight loss. So that, I think, is really, really good news. I should say, just to be fair, the effects on cholesterol were positive, it was in the right direction, but they were relatively modest. So for the time being, weight loss is not the best intervention to treat your high cholesterol. It's probably best to stick with uh, medication. 
So, small weight loss is good, it brings real health benefits, but it's of course no surprise at all to say uh, more weight loss would be better. So the question we've been asking ourselves is how can we get more weight loss um, in routine healthcare settings? One of the interventions we've been looking at is uh, meal replacements. So these are things like soups and shakes and bars that uh, are intended to replace a meal. They're calorie controlled, generally about 250 calories, and they're fortified with vitamins and minerals. Now this is a systematic review which is in progress, it's not finished and it's quite complicated, um, but the bottom line is that however you look at it, uh, meal uh, diets are more effective, more effective, uh, meal replacements are more effective than diets or programs that don't include meal replacements. So for sure, um, this appears to be a way to, to increase the amount of weight people, people lose. And again, this is looking at people after one year, even if they've only done the programme uh, for a few weeks or months. Now, the natural extension of meal replacements, where perhaps you've been having one or two of these products a day and a healthy meal, is that we go to something which we call total diet replacement, where you come off usual food completely for a short period of time. You entirely replace your usual food intake with soup, shakes, bars, these specially formulated products. Now that is quite a drastic way of dieting. Um, oh, sorry, I should just, I'd forgotten I put this in. That previous slide about meal replacements was complicated, so this is just a single study. This is the largest study which shows the benefit of meal replacements. What you see is over 5,000 people here who were randomly allocated to meal replacements or to, um, these were all people with diabetes. So the people who didn't get meal replacements just got the standard diabetes education program. What you see is that the diabetes education didn't really lose any weight at all, um, but those who had the meal replacement program lost uh, more than eight kilos in the first year. And even four years later, they were still uh, nearly 5% lower than they'd started. So I think that what that shows you is that you do get, with meal replacements, greater weight loss than we were seeing with the uh, weight loss groups that I showed you earlier. Okay, back to where I was. So if we go the next step and say, what if we go for total diet replacement, uh, what happens then? Well, these sometimes are called very low calorie diets because they tend to provide 800 calories a day, thereabouts, uh, which really is very severe dieting. Remember, people's typical energy needs are going to be, you know, two to 3,000 um, calories. So this is another systematic review. We looked at all the trials, which looked at very low calorie diets, and we looked at how much do people weigh at the end of one year. Once again, the diamond at the bottom is well to the left. People lose more weight on very low calorie diets than they do in the comparator treatment. Now, there's an important caveat here because these trials were all done in specialist obesity clinics. So they were done in situations where the control treatment, the comparator treatment, was a very intensive program. So people got a lot of behavioural support. And if you look in fine detail, what you can see is although the very low calorie diet group were four kilos lighter, the absolute weight loss, which is shown here, was around about 10 or 11 kilograms at the end of one year. The control groups lost, um, uh, lost about seven kilos. So these were obesity centers who were offering people a very effective uh, weight loss program. But even then, if they added into that very low energy diets, they were able to get four kilos additional weight loss. And what's been interesting is there is now a real interest in whether we can use this approach in routine care, so outside these specialist centres. And just before Christmas, a very interesting trial was published, the DIRECT trial. This was another study specifically in people who had diabetes. Now, it's not one of ours, it was done in, in Newcastle, and it's a slightly complicated diagram, so I'm just going to talk you through it. What you see here in this black dotted line is the people in the control group. Again, these were all people with diabetes, so the control group got standard diabetes education, 
and they didn't lose very much weight. What you see in the red line is people who went on this total diet replacement program, this time for somewhere between 12 and 20 weeks. Gradually food was then reintroduced um, and what we're doing is measuring them here at a year. And what you can see is for these people, after a year, they were about 15 kilos lighter than they had started. Now, not everybody can stick to it. This is a tough, extreme diet. And what you see in these dotted lines is the people who dropped out and didn't follow the programme. And so some dropped out right at the beginning. The ones who didn't really ever get started lost a little bit of weight, but not much. But some people dropped out here, and then their weight increased. Some people dropped out a bit later, their weight increased. But nonetheless, for people who can um, adhere to these programs, then actually they're extremely effective. And of course, the acid test in this study was not so much about losing weight. It was about the impact on diabetes. And what we see here is quite astonishing results. So, this is the amount of weight people lost expressed in kilos. Less than 5 kilos, up to 10 kilos, up to 15 and more than 15 kilos. And what it tells us is the proportion of people who at the end of one year were in what we call diabetes remission, meaning they no longer needed to take any medication for their, for their diabetes. So for people who lost just about 5 to 10 kilos, about 5 to 10% weight loss, a third of them had their diabetes in remission by the end of one year. And for those people who were su very successful, the ones who stuck with the programme right to the end, who lost 15 kilos, 86% of people were free of their diabetes at the end of one year. They're still at risk that that will come back later, particularly if they regain weight, but nonetheless, that is a really dramatic result. Wonderful for the individuals who no longer have to take the medication, who are free of this disease, um, but also fantastic for the NHS, because actually treating people with diabetes, it's a complex disease, takes an awful lot of care. So we're really interested in this approach. Um, we've been doing a very, very similar trial here in Oxford as part of our, our work with the BRC. Um, and what we have been able, unfortunately, we've finished it. It's not yet been published, so I can't really share the results with you, except to say I'm extremely happy and very optimistic that this is not just, this study here is not a one-off. I'm pretty confident that in routine care for people who don't have diabetes, but who are, if you like, just overweight, um, in fact, this may also be an effective treatment. So, so far, so good. I think we have got now clear and effective ways to support people to lose, to lose weight. Um, some of them are perhaps harder to stick to than others, but they do yield greater benefits. But what I've mostly been showing you is the results at one year. That's a fair way down the line. Most people have finished dieting several months earlier. But nonetheless, it's perfectly legitimate to say, ah, but what happens after that? And the truth is that people do tend to put weight back on. So if you remember back to one of the slides I showed you earlier, which was a list of about 40 studies, which we could, things we could do in routine care, this is the data from each of those studies showing all the weight measurements thereafter. And so you can see in pretty well every study, people tend to put weight back on. But there are a few things to remember. Firstly, this is averages. Some people, of course, have put weight back on quickly. Other people have kept the weight off long term. This includes the study I told you about at the beginning where a third of people were 7% lighter five years later. So this is the average. This is what the average person could expect. Of course, none of us are average. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that the rate of increase is not as quick as the rate of weight loss. People tend to imagine you go on a diet, you lose weight, and then you just pile it straight back on. Actually, that isn't what happens. Weight regain is slower. And those studies which have gone on for longer periods of, uh, longer periods of time actually suggest that the rate of weight regain wanes over time. So although you might gain weight quite fast initially, it tends to tail off. And the final crucial thing is that these studies go out to four or five years, 
and in not one single example are people back to where they started. So in fact, contrary to what you often hear, which is that diets don't work, diets do work because on average, people lose weight, on average, they keep it off for at least four to five years. And some people, of course, keep it off much longer than that. But the crunch question is, what happens to health? I hope I've shown you very persuasively that when you lose weight, your health improves. But what happens if you gain weight again? Um, you know, that, that's disappointing. It's very frustrating if you just bought yourself a new outfit. But what happens to your health? And there's some really good news here. And there's some good news that I don't think we talk about enough. Some of the health benefits persist. I'm just going to give you one example of that. This is a big trial called the Diabetes Prevention Program in the States. It took people who are overweight and at risk of developing diabetes, and they were randomised to three groups. We're just going to look at two of them now. The blue group was the control. They didn't really lose any weight. They didn't have any particular intervention. They didn't lose any weight. The red line shows people who went into the intensive lifestyle intervention program, so a behavioural weight management program, helping them to change their diet, become more physically active, um, and so forth. They lost about seven kilos in the first year, and then, as we've seen, as I've just explained, people tend, on average, to put it back on. And four years later, actually, their weight wasn't really very different from the people who hadn't lost weight in the first place. But nonetheless, in the bottom here, we see what happened in relation to diabetes. At the start, nobody had diabetes. They were all people at risk, but they did not have diabetes. And what these lines show is the number of people who developed diabetes over time. So the blue line is the number of people in the control group who didn't lose any weight. They steadily, there were more and more cases of diabetes as time went on. In this red line, you can see it's much, people do, some people do develop diabetes, but far, far fewer. After four years, so when they were up here, there were 58% less cases of diabetes than in the, people, in the control group. But even after 10 years, and remember now their weights have been pretty similar for six years, but even after 10 years, the incidence of diabetes was reduced by about a third. A third less cases of diabetes for losing just seven kilos, about a stone, even if that weight, on average, went back on again. One of the things we've really learned is that relatively modest weight loss brings surprisingly big health benefits, and that at least some of those benefits are sustained over time. It's probably because the damage and the harm that obesity does to our bodies is a function partly of how big you are, so the bigger you are, of course, the more harm there is, but also how long you carry that extra weight. So if you give yourself a bit of a break for four years, where you're a bit less heavy than you might have been, you get some lasting benefit from that. And if you want any more proof that actually losing weight improves your health, here's one final systematic review. This was published in the BMJ quite recently, not one of our studies, but done by some people we know very well at the University of Aberdeen, Alison Avenal's team. This was a systematic review of 34 randomised control trials of people who were obese. So this looked at trials where there'd been an intervention arm, where people had been helped to lose weight, and a control arm. And what they looked at is the risk of death. Did people die at some point during the follow-up period? What they showed is that if you'd been in the intervention group with the weight loss treatment, you had 18% less chance of dying than if you were in the control arm. And that's equivalent to six fewer deaths for every thousand people who died. So there we go, a final little bit of evidence that actually losing weight really is worthwhile. So that's my summary. Is dieting worth it? Absolutely it's worth it for people who are overweight. Intentional weight loss improves health, it decreases blood pressure, it re uh, reduces insulin resistance, there's a whole mass of other things I haven't had time to talk about today, not least reducing pressure on your joints, particularly uh, knees, so you're much less likely to need a knee replacement if you, lose, uh, if you lose some weight. 
absolutely can lead to remission of diabetes. And what we've seen in that recent data is that it reduces premature mortality. Some of the other take-home messages, I think, is that formal weight loss programs tend to be doing it yourself. So people do lose weight if they try to go it alone, but a little bit of support um, goes a long way, and people in general are more successful when they're in formal, structured uh, programs. Weight regain is common. I think we've got to be absolutely honest about that, because otherwise you raise people's expectations that this is going to last forever. It may not do. Weight regain is common, but it's not inevitable. A third of people keep weight off, a significant amount of weight off, for a long period of time. And you certainly won't be a successful slimmer if you don't diet in the first place. So you've got to, you've got to be in it to win it, as it were. You have to have a go, and a third of people will be very successful. But even if you put the weight back on again, there are some residual benefits. Um, and that, I think, is, is the really key thing, is that there are huge health benefits of obesity, of losing weight, and those persist in the long term. So let's just come back to my old friend, Mickey Stunkart, and remember what he said, most people will not stay in treatment, most will not lose weight, and those who do lose weight, most will regain it. That was in 1959, when he was at the start of his career. And he was interviewed again 40 years later, when he was at the end of his career, by the New York Times. One of the interesting things he said was, the 100 patients in the study were just given a diet sheet and sent on their way. That was the state of the art in 1959. I've been sort of surprised that people keep citing it. I know we do better these days. That was in 1999. Another, we're now another 18 years on. And I absolutely believe that Mickey would be really astonished and impressed at the improvement we've seen in the outcome of obesity uh, treatment. And uh, probably rather sad that people are still have this sort of millstone around their neck, our excessive pessimism that somehow diets don't work. Because if you look at evidence rather than just opinion, I think the evidence is very, very clear that dieting does work and it does improve health. And so, um, Today, in, in the middle of National Obesity Awareness Week, I think really is the time to say, yes, dieting is worth it, and how can we work together to support people? Because actually, it's with support that we're best able to turn obesity around. Thank you.